Hello YouTube. In this video, I'm going to be exploring a yet untouched area of the internet, which is Reddit. I have never really made videos about it because I was more focused on the Nadia Not website. But I've realized that the problem with the guy who writes that blog is that he's so stupid that eventually I find that dogging on him for 50 minutes gets stale. And so I wanted to throw something into the mix that could also allow me to bring in some positivity into these talks because at the end of the day, there are good information available on the internet out there and Reddit is a massive place. So surely I should be able to find interesting things to share with you. And after perusing the fitness page of that website, I have realized that I was at least sitting on an untouched gold mine. And therefore, I'm starting today with one of the top posts from that very subreddit, and I intend to explore more of their content and critic it or upload it when needed to try to separate the good from the bad. If you find a topic on Reddit fitness that you find interesting, share it with me. And if it's good, I'll make a video about it. But for today, the very topic I have selected is one that was created by a user who asserted the idea that he had managed to assemble a plethora of knowledge, a, a group and catalog of information that he believed to be a game changer for anyone who engages in fitness and he felt the need to share it with people. And this was widely seen as a very good move and people said that it was one of the best thing ever. So of course, me being curious, I wanted to check it out and see if it was actually good. In this article, I found both good and bad. And that's what I'm going to show with you today. The reason why I find it so appealing to discuss is because I always like looking at fitness from the eyes of someone who's not super advanced or not an expert and who is still discovering things, AKA a normie. And Reddit is of course full of normies. And so for one of them to say that they have found the Holy Grail, of course, piques my curiosity. I want to see what they found. What do normies consider to be top-notch information in the realm of fitness? Keeping in mind also that from what the guy said, he had collected that list of commandments, there are 10 of them, from the cream of the crop, the best of the best, the scientific YouTubers, the big massive dudes who are coaches with a thousand clients. So this should be amazing. We should discover things in here that I've never touched on the channel because it is such undiscovered advanced knowledge that your mind should be blown by the end of the, this video. So let us let us see what the king of all normies has managed to fetch for us today. The very first piece of reversionary knowledge is carbs. Carbs are not the enemy, he says, but they need to be heavily regulated and based on individual performance, digestive health and body fat with ethnic background being a huge factor. Okay. So we're touching on to something that is already a big myth in fitness. If you train, you have heard someone tell you that carbs are the enemy, they are the worst thing ever. And he opens by saying that that's not true. That is a good point in my book, because we still have a lot of normies who believe that if they eat white rice or potatoes, it's the end of all gains and that they need to stick to broccoli. That is, of course, not true. Carbs are good. But you need, of course, to pay attention to the way they interact with you. Some people cannot eat grains. Some people cannot eat bread. It wrecks their stomach. Some people are gluten intolerant. Some people do terribly on carbs. Some people like me do amazingly well. So it's all a question of preference and ethnic background. So first commitment, I see something that is actually a peer of wisdom that is really shared on YouTube fitness. That is correct. Your ethnic background plays a massive role in what you should eat or not. You should base your diet off of your ancestry and the way your body responds. For some reason, the light turned off. Interesting. Um, give me one second. I'm going to check that out. I believe we are under attack by the Janis at Reddit. They have found my location and they are attacking the electricity system directly. If it goes dark, it goes dark. So as I was saying, you should look at your ancestry to actually base your diet off of that. And also with the way your body responds, of course. 
But looking at what your ancestors had access to in terms of foods can actually help you avoid a lot of problems down the line. So that's amazing that I found that to be present in the commandments and it's just the number one. This might actually be a hidden gem. After that, he cites a bunch of people who have certain ideas on carbs like Charles Polykin and Stan Efferding who both say that carbs are not terrible but one said that you, for example, you need, you need to earn your carbs, which I also agree with. There's a saying I really like, carbs are for champions. You need to actually deserve your carbs. A lot of people stop their face with pasta, with rice, with bread. They don't need that. Those are calories they simply don't need. So this is a good way to think about it. Me, for example, in certain time periods back then when I was trying to cut, I would only eat carbs on days where I trained. And if I don't train, I don't eat carbs. I still do it to this day, not to cut, but to, to discipline myself. That way I don't actually skip days because I know that if I skip the day, I'm not going to eat carbs. So that's a good thing. He also mentions that carbs can lead to inflammation, which is correct in certain people. So that's also great. All right. This is something that is very surprising to start with. A very good information. Let's continue. Number two of the greatest commandments of lifting, sleep the greatest anabolic absolutely necessary. Yes, okay. The list goes on and still good information. He goes on to say that elite performance sleep, uh, elite performers sleep 10 to 12 hours a day. Is it, is it realistic for most people? I know that for me, I, I simply don't have the time because I'm done with my day at maybe midnight and I start my day at seven. So I get seven, eight hours tops. That's what I can get. For most people who work, that's what you'll get as well. Maybe you've, uh, you sneak a nap in in between at some point. 10 hours is even a bit overkill for most people because you simply won't be able to sleep that much. I know that for me, after eight, nine hours, I wake up and that's eight, my body is, is good. And for some people, if you oversleep, you'll fall sluggish and you'll fall actually worse without any increase in recovery. So a little bit of a problem here. Most people can get away with seven, eight hours. And as he says, it's important for everything, your hormones, your muscle growth, your recovery, your mental health as well. All of that is key. And it's the reason why I personally prioritize sleep in terms of recovery. I think that it's as if not more important than your diet. And that's why I preach also no caffeine. And I have an entire video dedicated to sleep. So for now, I am in full alignment with Reddit, which is something I never thought I would ever say in my life. Number three, programming. Okay, so... Pro, is it? Did I write this? Was I was I sleep was I sleepwalking? I, I wrote this article. Yeah, programming number three. Yes, programming is in, incredibly important. So it's mentioned. The list is already good by default. He says here that he splits his workouts with seventy two hours between muscle groups, which some people like, and they define it as the best for muscle synthesis. I believe you can really play around with that. Twenty four hours, forty eight hours doesn't really matter as long as you manipulate volume and intensity. If you give yourself a simple window of 24 hours between two muscle, two uh, sessions of the same muscle group, but you didn't work it as much the first day, that's still doable. So there's no hard, real defined limit for stuff like this. But at least he knows that there is such a thing as frequency for muscles, which some people ignore altogether. He preaches a variety of exercises, which is great but sometimes lead to an overkill where people just rotate exercises all the time and they don't realize that they are just stalling when they do that. They don't really uh, perform or progress because they just constantly relearn movement patterns. But he does mention that as long as they are in the same line of specificity, they allow constant progression on the key movements. All right, that is correct. So far, so good. He says only four main heavy days with the other days as options for accessory or cardio. That's my problem with, uh, with most of Reddit. They think in terms of powerlifting only, even when they train for looks or health, which is clearly shown here by the fact that he has heavy days, which makes no sense. You should have just days. And then within the days, you have variations of intensity and volume based on your rep ranges and the way you manipulate them. But not terrible, still good information. Wow, three out of three so far, and it's all good. I hope it keeps going that way. Number four, food choice. All right, we already discussed carbs. Here he discusses meat, and he says that grass-fed meat is overrated, which I neither agree nor disagree. But he does mention that the best diet is the one you stick to. And that is true unless your diet is shit. 
Because a lot of people can stick to a diet of frozen pizzas and beer. They can stick to that for 15 years. Problem is, after that, they're dead. So it's a yes, as long as the diet is healthy and conducive to longevity. But besides that, that is true. There is no point in having that weird bodybuilder diet where you eat like very dry, bland chicken with broccoli and you hate your life after two days. I don't know about you guys, but me, I love my food. I don't hate eating and it's very diverse and not restricted at all. I eat fats, I eat, I eat sodium, I restrict my sugars, but I still eat, eat, it, eat it sometimes in fruits or in healthy sources. It's Bodybuilding is not the, the, the daunting, tiring and bitter lifestyle that pro bodybuilders have tried to sell you. It's actually quite comfortable and a good time if you know what you're doing and it goes through food. He says that you must avoid processed foods and too much snacks, which is correct for people who are overweight. Besides that, you can snack if it's part of your macros. And you need vegetables and fruits that the body digests. Yes. So, a lot of good shit here. It's, it's impressive. He discusses his own diet with mostly vegetables. And then he actually uh, manages to complete that with animal products, which is also what I do. All right. Five. Warm up. Stretching is apparently a waste of time. Depends. Sometimes it is. A lot of people who stretch before the workout, yes, it's a waste of time. And if you just stretch bef because that's what we do, then it's also bad. You must stretch to improve mobility and health in certain portions of the body. And that's only a supplement to the real work, which is mobility with weights. If you have problems with, I don't know, your armstring mobility, just stretching them is not enough. You need to walk them. You need to do a hip hinge to stretch the muscle. So the, the stretching, the, the actual manual stretching will happen afterwards. But it's the reason why the very term of stretching makes no sense. You stretch your muscles when you lift weights. So that technically does constitute stretching. And that's the exact same thing you do when you bend over and you press your, your leg or you try to extend the leg or the arm. You do the exact same thing without weight. So it has its place, but not in the way most people do it. He does say here that cardio before your lift causes you to be insulin resistant, preventing fat loss. Okay, you see where we're heading here? It's, it's Reddit. You had to be prepared for that. Reddit loves science. So the second they can put their studies about that, that thing that no one has ever heard about, they will because it makes them sound smart. I don't know about that. I'll, the only thing I know is that cardio before weights is not a good idea for the simple reason that you're damaging your ability to be intense on the weights. And that the justification of saying, well, I warm up for the weights is void because the best warm up to lift weights is to lift lighter weights. So I don't agree with the uh, idea, but I share the sentiment. After that, it's a bunch of stuff also about potentiation exercises, which again is Reddit trying to sound scientific and therefore smart, when in reality, potentiation just means warm up with the same lift with light weight so that you can fire up the, the nervous system, send uh, synovial uh, uh, fluid into the tendons and fill the muscle up with blood so that it's ready to work and not get injured stupidly with a load that you're not prepared to move. So besides that, all of the complications about three minutes on the clock and I potentiate and then I do this, yeah, that's most of the time a waste of time. He explains that by saying that you should follow the advice, the brain should know the range of motion and weights should get heavier. I don't really know what that means. I mean, it just that's just lifting. So maybe that's good advice for normies. I don't know. Again, I'm touching all, all of these from the standpoint of someone who already knows pretty much all that he's going to say. So maybe that can be useful for someone. But uh, besides that, a lot of talk about rep ranges, a lot of talk about weak links. I mean, here he discusses the fact that the squat may be upper back A, lower back B, then armstring C, which I believe means that he's basically pairing the muscle groups that are going to be the most involved. Uh, the upper back is not really involved that much on the squat. I have no idea what that noise was. It was interesting, but it's not involved. It's just packed and you move the weight on it. It's the same for the deadlift, by the way. It's a stabilizer. The real mover is to be found somewhere else. But if we discuss weakest link, that's, that's a faulty mindset altogether. It's the same people who tell you that 
if you round on the deadlift, it's because you have a weak upper back. When in reality, it's the exact opposite. If your upper back rounds, it's because you have a, a weak lower back. Everything starts from the hips, the glutes, and the core. And then it, it sends shock waves throughout the entire, the, the entire chain. I said in the past that many people who round the upper back tend to also round the lower back, but it's because they compensate. It's not that the upper back is weak, it's that the lower back is weak. It cannot stay stable. If it could, the upper back could stay stable as well. But the problem with that is, uh, again, it's a powerlifting centric mindset that leads a lot of people to do a ton of accessory work for their upper back, or they'll do like rack pulls, which are good, but not for the reason they think. It's not that the muscles of the upper back are weak, it's that their technique is not correct. So that is to be expected. I, I knew I was going to find some myths within that topic and within that, uh, that thread, but uh, not too bad. I mean, it's not going to get people hurt. It, it's not the... It's not the majestic uh, piece of knowledge that I was expecting, but it's not terrible. He does preach 4x25 with no rest, which, I mean, can be good, I guess, when you just get started, if you have no work capacity. But I wouldn't even recommend that to most people. It's completely outside of any intensity rep range. And he, again, preaches that as maybe something to open the day, which never do that. Never do baby weight for a ton of reps before your actual strength work. You're just going to shoot yourself in the foot. Because now, you took energy away from the main, the main set with your repetitions, your worthless repetitions, that did nothing for hypertrophy, but, sold, but stole reps from the, the strength work. So this is a lose-lose situation. Bad advice. The first bad advice I'm seeing here. He does cite Matt Wenning, which is a powerlifter, and so maybe that's a potential, potential, potentiation, wow, potentiation tactic that only works for powerlifters. Um, I don't know why you would have someone do that. But uh, I think that I understand why. I'm not sure he understood where Matt was coming from. A lot of the time, when very strong powerlifters train, what they do is they regain strength they already possessed. They don't gain the strength. They already had it and they build back up. And in which case, doing a ton of reps with lower weight will help because it's going to bring back that strength. But if the strength was never there in the first place, you're essentially the type of you're, you're essentially trying to dig into your uh, your backyard, thinking there's going to be a treasure underneath, and there's no treasure. You just dug a hole. So there was no point altogether. So that was his talk for the warm-ups. Finally, I did with something. Let's see number six. Number six, and again, I remind you, this is apparently the list of things that you need to know, that Reddit thinks that is absolutely essential for lifters. Number six is walking. A 10-minute walk after you eat a meal improves digestion, decreases DOMS, helps with insulin sensitivity. A big, big focus on insulin. I have personally, I can be honest and upfront with you guys, never once thought about my insulin sensitivity in my life because uh, it's just a non-factor. And I think that this mostly comes from, again, pro bodybuilders who are taking insulin shots and therefore it's become a very important part of their life and their training because if they fuck up, they die. But for you and I, it's really not a thing. Most of the time, most natural lifters, you can just eat normally and healthy. Your insulin does the job. It knows what it's doing. And for people who try to influence it, I know guys like this who are like picking their insulin before their protein shake. Yeah, that doesn't do much at all because it's simply not effective. If you were to consume a protein shake and you lacked, you completely lacked the resources for that protein to be sent to the muscle, you must be in a dire situation. Like it's, well, not at the level where you should focus about gains. You're most likely somewhere on an island and you have no access to food. In which case the question is, how the fuck did you get your hands on a protein shake? But for the rest of the world, don't worry about that unless you are insulin resistant already. But I do agree that walking is very important. Walking a lot is important for health, being mobile. Um, a lot of people, me included in the past, started to believe that just because I lifted weights, I was fine and I could do, well with, I could do away with walking. The problem is that I quickly realized it was not true when I was forced to walk. Because when I was waddling my fat ass, with my, my 400 pound squat and I couldn't walk 15 minutes without having pain in my ankles and, a sh and shortness of breath, I realized that I was going about it the wrong way. 
you must walk. Walking is an essential part of being a human. And when you start to lose the ability to walk, that is when things go bad, because usually that is a sign that your health markers are going down, down, down. And that's a good indication that you're doing something wrong. You're packing on too much mass. Keep walking with calisthenics in your training, and you will stay on the right, the right path forever. Because the body will show you that it still has the ability to move. So yes, do walk. Stop taking the elevator. Just walk up. You have small calves and you complain about it. Walk up the stairs on your tippy toes. You'll see your calves will grow after a while. Do that every day. Take a walk if you walk in the office. Take a break and just walk around the building. Go outside. For me, when I walk, I, I keep my breaks. And when I have 30 minutes, I go outside and I walk in the grass, shirtless, in the sun. That way I walk around, I take the sun. People look at me strange, doesn't matter to me. I got my walk in and I managed to also take some vitamin D in. So very good information. Seven. Cardio. Okay, cardio. Cardio is a, is a big meme in the fitness sphere. For one simple reason, most people think it's essential when in reality it's not, or at least they believe that certain forms of, of cardio are important and unavoidable, like for example, running on a treadmill or doing the steppers. And this is also linked to pro bodybuilders because they do that all the time. Thing is, cardio really in reality means getting your heart rate up. That's it, to have a healthy, strong heart and to send blood into the body. Any way you can achieve that is good. You can do that just doing jumping jacks. That's a good way to do cardio. So for him, he says that in terms of cardio, he prefers high intensity interval training, which I also prefer. But the reason why for him is that long, slow distance work inhibits muscle growth and fat loss. I call bullshit on that. This sounds like a made-up stuff from some shady study from five years ago. I don't believe that to be true at all because it just simply makes no sense whatsoever. Why would the body try to retain fat if you constantly put it through long-distance running? Wouldn't it try to shed the fat to make you more effective? And on top of that, why would it inhibit muscle growth? It makes no sense. It could inhibit muscle growth if you were actually drawing from calories that are needed for the growth of the muscle, but that's not what is said here. It literally means here that if you, if you run for too long, your body will just go into shock and it won't build muscle. That has been disproven a long time ago. So again, Reddit has a tendency to focus on science until it's not pushing their agenda and then they ignore it. I don't know the guy personally, but apparently he got his sources from the best of YouTube fitness. So I don't know where he got that from, maybe the professor, but uh, maybe he didn't get that this was a satirical video and that the professor hates cardio because he's a bro. For a lot of people, you can run long distance if you want. As I said, the reason why I prefer high intensity interval training is because it saves time and it's more fun. For a lot of people, it'll be fun. It'll be better to just do a few sprints or do the beep test than to go for a run. Most people will have rather shorten the amount of time they do cardio. The best way to do it, of course, is also giant sets. So, so far, I agree with most of what he says. And the few things he says, he presents as gospel come directly from the church of science. And even if you espouse them, they won't hurt you, which is, is an improvement because when you talk to a normie, and it's something I realized today, in reality, the most dangerous thing you can do is put in their heads dangerous ideas that are going to get them hurt or quitting uh, quickly. And it's something I saw today because I had the misfortune of landing on a video of a guy who was a massive YouTuber who had nothing to do with fitness, who was watching gym fell videos and making fun of the people lifting. And what I saw on the channel in the comments blew my mind. At some point, there was a guy doing uh, cheat pull-ups with his legs and people in the comments were saying, oh no, these are butterfly pull-ups and they're actually better for muscle growth. And everyone was agreeing with that. So I was telling to myself, okay, so these are people, there were tens of thousands who are going to do that and think that they're going to grow from it and they won't. And also at some point there was a guy doing neck curls in the video and he was made fun of by the host of the video. And I was like, all right, so you're so detached from the human body that you don't realize that your neck is a muscle. Of course, the guy had a pencil neck like this. So it's ironical because he would actually benefit from walking on said neck. I love that to say that those poor kids that watch that guy are going to be fucked with that information. Whereas people on Reddit who might not know much about fitness and who are on Reddit fitness might find this and get decent information with some misinformation here and there. 
he continues with eight. Build the backside. If the muscle is behind you, chances are you need to build it stronger. Correct. Most people work the muscles they see in the mirror, meaning all of this. It's very common for people, gym bros, to only work on their arms, their chest, their, their, and their, their arms, their arms, their chest, their abs. But after that, they have shoulder pain because they have weak rear delts and traps. They have lower back pain because even though they never squat and deadlift, they have the integrity of yogurt in their thoracic spine. So all of that are problems that can be avoided if you just walk the backside. On top of that, it's aesthetic. A big juicy back is aesthetic. A big juicy uh, gluteus maximus and arm string is aesthetic as well. So you need to build them up. But the problem is that here, he says that you need to build those up by making them a priority in your accessory exercises selection. No, they need to be a priority across the board. With your compounds, you need to have days dedicated to work these areas. You need to work the upper back. I was going to say something fucked up. Yeah, I'll say it, I don't give a fuck. You need to treat your upper back like a slave, okay? It doesn't get a say in the matter. It doesn't receive treatment or, uh, or a 401k. You, you must whip that thing into submission. You must throw volume at your upper back until it cracks because if you do it properly with proper form, you won't get injured. You will just grow. As long as, of course, you are habituated to the amount of volume and you progress. But the upper back needs to be tortured. It needs to be damaged. So work it. Make it a priority every single day. Don't just do like four sets of lat pull down like many people do and think you're going to get big lats from that. You won't. You need more than that. He also says that upper back not strong enough will change scapular position on bench press. Yes, but it's still a byproduct of a poor technique. Nine, salt. Up the intake of salt. Yes. There are two types of misinformation on Reddit fitness, on YouTube fitness, everywhere fitness. It's either bad information coming from fitness professionals that are really just gimmicks to sell products or misinformation from people who believe that they have health information, that they have uh, nutrition advice to give to people when they're only based off of myth. For example, the idea that salt is bad for you. I have heard that throughout my childhood. When I was a kid, if I would salt my food, I would be told, hey, don't salt, it's bad for you. And I never understood why exactly, because everyone had salt on their table. So if it's so bad, why can't I salt? And on top of that, Aren't we supposed to consume that? Is If it's necessary as a, a mineral element for humans to survive and thrive, why is it apparently so bad to just have a pinch on your food? I understand that having too much of it is bad, but the di diabolization of salt is a big factor for why a lot of people have low work capacity, they get cramps. It's because they're lacking in sodium, they're lacking in the necessary ingredients to have your uh, hydration met because you can drink all, all the water in the world if you're not intaking enough minerals the water just goes right through your body ever happened to you or you drink a ton of water and you think oh i'm being so good then you go to piss and it's clear yeah you're just pissing that that water is doing this through your body it's not being absorbed by the cells because you are not fully charged in terms of minerals so very good it also protects from a lot of problem like thyroid problems, immune system problems, it stimulates organs, salt is good for you. And especially if you have a whole food diet like he preaches, you are lacking in salt. People don't realize it. When you buy a box of like frozen pizza or pasta or the garbage that people eat, there's a ton of salt in that. In your diet that you make at home, there's almost none. So salt your food. On top of that, it's good. It tastes good. He does say that it's the single biggest thing you can do to impact performance, which I disagree with for one simple reason. It's a baseline. Diet and everything is a baseline, meaning that it's just a, it's a routine thing. It should always be present in your life. If you lack it and you misperform, it's not because it's super important. It's because you just fail to do something that is just essential. Like if someone told me, oh, I couldn't deadlift because I stopped breathing. Yeah, because you stop breathing, right? It doesn't mean that breathing is the most important thing for deadlift. It's something that is necessary to be able to do it, but it should be a given. So it's the same for nutrition, recovery, hydration. These are not what people present, meaning that they are important, but they are important in the background. These are background information. 
the most important thing is your training. But of course, the training cannot occur if these things are not on check. So people will say that it's the most important. No, it is the most important in terms of stability and lifestyle. But in terms of getting results, they are not. The training is the most important thing. And that leads us to 10, the post-workout drink. Aha! First time that I actually see a title, I'm thinking, hmm, I might see some bullshit here and some actual bad information. So let's see. The body super compensates after a workout. Yes, but not the way most people think. It's not like you do curls and the body in two minutes is like, oh, I'm freaking out and it's super compensating. It super compensates for a period of time that is basically the period it takes for the muscle to recover it, which is the period of time where the muscle has triggered its protein synthesis to respond to the attack and damage that you did to it. So for the people who freak out after a workout, you have 24 hours to intake the nutrition necessary, and even that is incorrect because technically the body before that already intook nutrition. It's, it, you're, you're not like some kid in Africa who's dying of thirst, right? You're most likely either in a Western nation or in a third world country with food, so you ate the day before. Yeah, your body has nutrients still. Your body has something to work with. The idea that if you, if you miss one meal, it's the end of the world, that's bullshit. That's something that supplement companies have told you so they can sell you products that you drink all day, every day. You can miss a meal. You can wait two hours. Unless you're, unless you're someone who needs a ton of calories, it's not going to hurt you. It might hurt performance, but recovery, not that much, as long as it doesn't become chronic. So the idea that you need to immediately replenish, which is what he says after a workout, is finally... The little, you know, little smudge of shit in the pile of gold that is the Ten Commandments. He drinks orange juice after training for liver stimulation, dextrose, sodium, caffeine, which is funny because he consumes caffeine. And at the same time, he says that sleep is important, which unless the caffeine has really no impact on your sleep, is contradictory. All of that is not necessary. Okay, You can if you want to. Having an orange juice or something sugary after training, it feels good, okay? But it doesn't really have the impact you think it does on your muscles and on your recovery. It might be good in terms of a placebo effect, but don't become so stressed out and anxious that you're the type of guy who trains and then rushes home to have his food. Like, I knew dudes like this with, like, the, what is the, the, the recovery window, the super recovery window, whatever, or they would drink their shakes after the gym, the second after the gym, and even make it in the locker room because they were so afraid of missing out. You're not missing out on anything, but you are making big companies profit off of your fears because now you're going to buy their products that you're going to drink after your workout. He does say, however, that you should eat proteins or fats immediately afterwards as it slows down absorption. I also call bullshit on that. I don't really see why that would be the case. It's funny because with these types, with the Reddit types, I find that their knowledge base is so similar to boomers that it's uncanny. By boomers, I mean those guys, and maybe you know some of them, who are in their 50s and 60s and who vaguely trained in the 80s and who have all of these ideas in their heads. My family uh, actually had friends like this, and I remember training and having one of these guys tell me, hey, after your training, don't eat directly because if you eat, all of the muscles, all of the blood in your muscles is going to go into your stomach and so your muscles won't grow. And I remember actually believing that when I was 14. Of course, now I understand that it's bullshit. This is the same caliber of misinformation. So don't be afraid of something like this. Uh, it's too bad that that's a number 10 because we are going to end on an actual, an actual good note. But in terms of things that I believe are important, we are missing a ton of things. Meaning that if I were to make a list of the 10 most important commandments in lifting, this would not be the list. Maybe I would keep 20% of this. There's a large, large focus on, on nutrition, which once you figure it out, nutrition is not that important. Training is not really mentioned much. And when it is, there's a lot of gimmicks. There's a lot of poor programming practices. There is also the... What I, what I could describe as a microcosmic hyperfocus that fitness loves to do. It's the practice of pushing a gimmick and just looking at it intently and thinking, oh, all of my gains are here. Like salt, for example. The, guys, the guy thinks that salt is the most important thing. No, you believe that because some guy told you to up your salt intake, you did it, and then you, you perform because you were deficient in sodium, 
And now you think that it's the panacea. Well, it's not the case. It's just that you were so-so when it comes to your nutrition. So, of course, it made a big difference. Same for someone who, doesn't, who never drinks water. If they hydrate, they're going to massively perform. Why? Not because water is magical, but because they were lacking something essential. So, for a first Reddit thread, not so bad. And actually, as I was going through, most of what I saw was blatantly obvious information, which is to be expected from Reddit, but nothing glaringly bad. So, it's, it's a mix. It's an in-between. I'm going to keep looking again if you find a thread that you think it's interesting and that got a ton of upvotes, not some guy who got two likes. Let me know, send me the link, and I'll review it. But for this first installment of the best slash worst of, of Reddit fitness, this 10 commandments list is actually quite decent. So I hope that I was able to actually bring my little pinch of salt, debunk some of the misinformation and highlight the things that actually matter, keeping in mind, of course, that as I said, I would not be telling you that these are the 10 most important things for your progression in lifting. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.